Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, CNN reporter and former FBI special agent Josh Campbell on mass shootings in America. When I'm covering a mass shooting, I don't pause to think, well, you know, let's get the shooter's side of this and figure out well, what, you know, what, what were they thinking? I do not like saying the name of the shooter. I don't like showing the shooter. I can remember one time that I actually said the suspect's name. Uh, and that was the moment he was actually formally charged. But after that, I have no interest in giving this person any notoriety because we know so many of these shooters actually look for that. I was actually in a place where I saw all these attacks on the FBI daily, constant attacks from the White House. You know, the FBI, they're crooks, they're corrupt. And if any listener out there, if your boss spent all day saying that you're a crook, <laughs> that would obviously grate on you. Josh, welcome to Chatter. Hey, my friend. Great to be with you. It's good to see you again. And actually, I've been seeing a lot of you on TV for all the wrong reasons, because you're one of the leading on the scene reporters for, among other things, but mostly mass shootings. So it's 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 good to see you and it's good to see you not with a crime scene behind you and the tragedy that comes with it. It is certainly a tough beat. Uh, and as you mentioned, I mean, I've been far too busy uh, over the last couple of years, I'd say. Just, you know, we've seen obviously this wave of mass shooting after mass shooting. And it's interesting, my brother is a firefighter paramedic, and we often kind of compare notes. You know, we say we're both in the field where, you know, if you're bored, that means that bad things aren't happening. And I mm -hmm. certainly wish I was bored a lot more these days. You know, I do remember when I was at CIA, we often told a version of that which is if the day was quiet, that's probably pretty good for national security, right? That means no one has invaded anyone. There hasn't been a, a kidnapping of an American overseas in the area we worked. There wasn't some, some major threat. But on the other hand, we're there to deal with that stuff. So it almost feels like you're not doing your job if it's a quiet day. No, it's, that's right. I mean, that whole mantra, right, no news is good news, um, certainly applies to that beat when you're covering crime and justice issues and, and all the shootings. Um, you know, what we try to do, though, is in, in each of these incidents, which we've seen over and over, is to try to answer the question for the viewer, well, what happened? And particularly with, you know, some of these mass shootings, there's always the question of motive, which is obviously at the forefront. You know, why did this person do what they did? Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to, to delve into that. And then, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, I see this as a public service, right? Not just informing the public, but also trying to get ahead of the next one. And, you know, for all the reasons we can get into, you look at this Highland Park shooting uh, outside of Chicago that I was just covering. I mean, the warning signs were there. And so I made it a point of my reporting from that scene to not just explain what happened, but to really get into that, because I see that as the public service. I look, if there's someone out there who might be wondering, um, you know, what should I be looking out for, either in a loved one or a friend, you know, these flashing red warning signs that we mm -hmm. saw with that shooter, folks aren't going to know about it unless we're actually, you know, telling that story and, and getting that information out there. So it's a it's certainly an uphill, you know, battle, so to speak, because, you know, obviously with the, the prevalence of some of these guns and we've seen just incident after incident, but we're trying to do our small part. Well, I would I do want to get to the challenges of, of several of those things you mentioned overall later in this conversation and how you feel about it. But first, for, for many people who, who watch too many crime procedurals and blockbuster movies, it may seem odd that a former FBI special agent like yourself is able to establish a rapport with local police in, in America because entertainment has seared in our memory that state and local law enforcement hates the FBI and vice versa. And yet there you are with your you're not wearing your, your FBI credentials or anything, but clearly <laughs> that's your background. And, and I think a lot of people on the scene know that. And yet we don't see evidence of hatred or even discomfort from the local law enforcement that you talk to. So is this just a myth that there is this rivalry bordering on violent rivalry between the FBI and state and local law enforcement? Yeah, I think it's one of the, the biggest myths out there, actually. Uh, and I think a lot of that is a product of Hollywood because, you know, it, it makes for good drama. You have the crime scene, you have, you know, the local law enforcement who they are obviously always first on the scene because they're out on patrol. 
but you know, there's the iconic moment in in every bad television show about police where the feds show up and say, "All right, it's our scene now. Here, champs, you know, we got this." Um, which in reality, I've never had that experience. You know, being in, F- in the FBI for almost 13 years and working very closely with local law enforcement, um, it, almost uh, you know, to an incident, it's it's very collaborative. So you're telling me, I mean, you're blowing my mind here. You're <laughs> telling me that Die Hard is not reality when Robert Davi comes in and and takes over and does everything but spit on the local cops that that is not true shocking shocking i know right so lapd is at nakatomi plaza and obviously they do all the hard work and then the feds show up and say we're taking over uh, that's not real and then also in that movie i love that you know the they they, they basically be clown the fbi agents so much and and oh, yeah. the way they're described um which also isn't true i mean you know like every outfit there's a they're you know uh, knuckleheads but um i found in the fbi that you really had you know professional people who were going to work to do their job and you know although it makes for good television i mean the reality is when you talk, think about these these relationships between state, federal, local law enforcement, the FBI, by comparison, is very, very small. I mean, there's only some 13,000 special agents to cover the whole world, basically. Compare that with the city of New York, right, where you have upwards of almost 40,000 police mm-hmm. officers on the street. And so uh, the FBI couldn't do its job if it was the only entity that was out there. Yeah. What I will say is that there have been instances where, I, where I've seen that, that you get into a little bit of friction whenever the, the question comes down to, well, do we take this case federal or do we take this case um, you know, in state court? And that there's some friction be- between prosecutors I've seen where, you know, obviously every prosecutor wants to make the case. Um, but from the pure investigator standpoint, so the FBI agent or the local police, you know, basically comes down to how do we solve this case? How do we do it effectively? And then what is the uh, judicial avenue that's going to get this person sent to jail for the longest amount of time? Is that a federal charge? Is that a state charge? And so for the investigators, we don't really care. We're just going to work together and solve the case. Um, yeah. So so most of that is a myth, but I think it, it, it's kind of the, the drama of Hollywood. What is it that in the real world, what is it that each side, if you can call it that, um, maybe each member of the team sees the other as bringing? Because in the movies, it's usually with the negativity, as we mentioned. But for the state and locals, the FBI is big. They have infinite resources. You know, they'll be flying in on the helicopter, reliving Vietnam. Whereas the state and locals have the 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 street experience in that jurisdiction. They have the grit. They they understand the situation better than these suits flying in from Washington. I, I assume like many stereotypes, there might be some truth to that, but I get the sense it's it's actually quite different in most respects. How, how do you see that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, the, the cops on the ground that are on the beat, they know their neighborhood better than than anyone else. And so, you know, for example, when I was an FBI agent uh, in Los Angeles, you know, I had a region I was covering uh, for counterterrorism purposes, but, you know, I didn't know every single neighborhood. And, you know, the, the, the guy that stood on the street corner, uh, you know, uh, selling DVDs, who may be a good intelligence collection platform for a cop, like, hey, have you seen anyone suspicious out here? Um, the feds aren't aren't doing that kind of thing. But we're, we're, we're what they do bring to the table, the the FBI is um, when you think about, you know, not every incident, not every you know major mass shooting, for example, is going to be a federal case um, there. You know, this Highland Park case that I was just working on, there wasn't necessarily a federal nexus uh, at the outset. We did learn that the suspect crossed state lines and went into Wisconsin and then back. So, you know, if 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 this Hollywood turf thing were real, then the FBI agent would come in and say, all right, we got this. This is now an interstate case. That's not going to happen. But what the feds do, as you mentioned, uh, do is they bring in just a host of resources. Um, and in you know mass shooting after mass shooting, we've seen what's called the FBI's ERT, the evidence response team. These are the crime scene, crime scene forensic experts that are gathering ballistic information. They're gathering evidence. They're trying to recreate the trajectory of where the, you know, the bullets were fired from, all of that. And that's all important because if you have a suspect who survives um, and there is a prosecution, you have to build an airtight case. And so quite frankly, in, uh, in so many of the cases that I've covered, both in the media and in the FBI, it's the local 
law enforcement welcoming you? Because a lot of these, you know, apart from a big city like L.A. or New York, they may not have their own forensic team, their own crime scene team, their own ballistics team that can look through databases of firearm information and the like. So I think it really comes down to resources. That's what the feds bring to the table. Um, and, and most often it, it's very collaborative in, in that process. Everyone trying to seek the same goal to bring justice to the victims, to ensure that whoever the suspect is goes you know, to jail for a long time. Is there still, and I say still because I experienced some of this when I was working in government, is there still a, a bit of a barrier because of the overclassification and overprotection of things from Washington? I mean, at least on joint terrorism cases, there often was the issue of the things that were most relevant to the state, local, tribal partners were things that were classified at a level that a lot of people on the ground just weren't cleared to see. And a whole bunch of the process in the JTTFs and otherwise was, how do we get information to people who need it? Did, did you experience some of that as well? Yes. Back, back in the FBI and, and even now, I hear stories and talking to folks you know, that, that are in law enforcement. Um, and, and for the listeners, so this, this task force set up, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, it's basically led by the FBI. Every uh, field office, all 56 field offices have their own Joint Terrorism Task Force. And so they bring in members from local agencies and you know, they'll get security clearances. You'll have police officers who have top secret clearances. Um, and then obviously that limits what they can then brief back to their, their own mothership um, in whatever, whatever agency they're in. And so I've seen that uh, come become an issue in times where you have a police officer or you know a member of this agency or the task force who wants to tell their agency something that has to be coordinated. Um, I think the I think a challenge that's still out there is how do you get information that's actionable um, and that's even informative out to the masses? Um, you know, in a way that's actually impactful. And I'll give you an example. After every one of these major incidents that we see, the FBI, uh, typically the director or the deputy director will host a, a conference call along with the Department of Homeland Security with police officials across the country, right? It's this, uh, right. Uh, and it's kind of rote now. You have these big conference calls, they get on and they say very generally, very generically, this is what happened um, and this is what you need to be looking out for. I can tell you, David, those, you know, if you're a police officer in whatever city, the feds, they're not bringing anything new to you that you don't already know. Uh, and the reason why they have to keep that somewhat vague is because they don't want the details, you know, leaking out, obviously, um, uh, to an intrepid journalist, for for example, who might you know be trying to, to right. cover a story. Um, and so there's just a, this kind of constant rub about, well, is, is what the feds are sharing, is it even worthwhile or is it so diluted that, yeah, no joke, if there's a crowd, then that may be a target, right? Or if there's an anniversary of an attack, that might be a lucrative time. Um, so that's the challenge. How do you get, how do you get information that is actually actionable uh, to the people who need it rather than just you know, this very 30,000 foot you know, uh, uh, view that, that may not be helpful at all? That really speaks to the larger warning dilemma and I, I remember it from working counterterrorism before and after 9-11. And I could understand the public frustration with some announcement from the federal government that we're in a high threat environment and people need to be nervous in, and I'll just make up one, although this may have been a reality, but people in New York need to be especially sensitive during the next month. And the response would be, okay, for what? Like, are... Are we looking for a particular person? Are we looking for a particular target? Can't you do a better time frame than the next month? The issue from the government side is we may not have those details, but we have a very reliable, credible source who has, who has proven reliable and has been corroborated in the past. And we have strong reason to believe that this is valid threat reporting. And that source has told us about a plot to do something in New York in the next month. And we don't have details. And you can understand the frustration without without there being an easy solution for it. That's right. Very much frustration. And then you have to wonder, you know, what, what good are you actually doing if you're just, you know, in the spirit of sharing information, just pushing information out that might be so obvious that even someone without a law enforcement background will be like, yeah, no joke. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, you know this as well on, on the intelligence community side of the house. 
Um, after 9-11, you know, there was obviously this mantra, well, it's, it's now a need to share, right? Whatever we get, we have to push out. No one wants to be sitting on that critical piece of information that might help stop the next attack. And obviously, that, I, I agree with all of that. But there, there is an extreme that, you know, you'll probably laugh when I recount this, but, you know, uh, for those who, who uh, uh, may not, you know, be familiar with the intelligence community, it, it kind of took on the extreme where every piece of raw information was just being blasted out to, you know, thousands and thousands of recipients. In fact, on the uh, current uh, or the raw intelligence reports that we get sent out, you know, at the top line uh, uh, before the actual information, there are all the recipients. And so our, our joke inside the FBI was, okay, if I had a sensitive piece of information that we wanted to put out, um, you know, the, the joke inside was, be careful what you put out because, you know, this is going to Coast Guard Outstation 39, you know, as one of the multitude of entities on this um, uh, document that's being blasted out. And the joke there being that everyone under the sun is going to obtain this piece of information. Um, and so we found ourselves, you know, having to kind of police what what got sent through through different channels. Um, the spirit was to push out whatever you could, but then there was always this question, well, how impactful are we actually being? Are we just flooding people's inboxes with information that may not even help them you know, do anything at all? And then there's the perverse but real dynamic of if something were to happen in New York in that month and people died and an investigation showed that there was a credible, reliable source saying that something was going to happen and you did not warn the public, then there's hell to pay. So Right. You're, you're kind of taught, you're caught both ways and you're taught recently, at least you're taught to overshare rather than under report. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And, and it's, it's interesting on that note, too, because, you know, as an FBI agent, well, we would we would be tasked, um, you know, we had our own cases, we had our own our own day job. But if there was some, for example, I'll, I'll just I'll, you know, I can't obviously can't give any specifics, but just to give you a hypothetical. So if I'm an FBI agent in Los Angeles and as you mentioned, there's something um that possibly might happen in New York, we would actually get tasks from the counterterrorism division and the FBI, go canvas all your sources, you know, with this list of questions. And like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm going to, you know, th these sources relationships obviously are, are, are um, very unique, you know, in, in and of themselves. So am I going to go find a source in counterterrorism and say, I need to sit down and ask you these 86 questions that <laughs> someone just tasked me um, obviously it's not going to happen, but it was just in that spirit. We need to gather every possible nugget that we could, uh, you know, to, to get out to other people. And so, and I, and I, I know I sound cynical, but it's just, there is a happy medium between being effective and pushing information out and yeah. just, you know, just blasting information for, for that, for the sake of doing so. Another stereotype that has come up and I think been reinforced in entertainment, uh, that we've discussed before, uh, the two of us. Uh, affected both of us. And that's the idea that the FBI and the CIA cannot work effectively together, that they're usually fighting each other more than they're cooperating. And it's personal animosity, as well as professional animosity. What do you think about that? You know, it's interesting. So these are these are both career fields where, you know, if you have a an FBI agent that, you know, we, we, we would work with CIA domestically, but primarily my my role in working with the agency was overseas. Um, I spent uh, several years on an international team uh, embedded with the military, embedded with CIA. And so I look at it through kind of that lens where you had these fields where you have, you know, type A personalities, very, you know, dynamic people typically that are very mission driven. And so you did have, you know, some encounters where you might feel like you were rubbed the wrong way, just, you know, people in their, in their zealous sense of trying to stop a threat or to, um, you know, catch a, catch a suspect, um, you know, there, there would be a conflict here and there. But in the main, I mean, I worked very, very closely with the agency and it's because we all, we all knew we had our own roles, right? So for example, if, and this might be insightful to, to listeners as well, that you have these teams overseas of, military personnel, CIA personnel, FBI personnel. And if you think of what everyone brings to the table, so obviously with CIA, the lead on gathering, well, what is happening, right, in this area? Um, who are the sources of information that maybe we need to tap? And there would be instances, for example, where I would recruit a source overseas and, you know, coordinating with the agency to think, well, look, I have a really good rapport with this person. We're getting this information. And they would say, yeah, go for it. Like, you're, you're the guy on this one. Let's gather information. Uh, but in the main agency, the agency would bring the information piece to the table. The military would have the action arm um, uh, a lot of the times with their resources and, you know, just being able to 
um, get us into places, for example, if we were trying to find uh, a particular terrorism suspect. And the FBI brought to the table all the, 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 the finishing piece, right? So if you're going to apprehend someone, you have to prosecute them. And I would actually, I in a number of instances, I would have these discussions with uh, uh, agency personnel overseas and, and military personnel, particularly, and again, not, not getting into anything too sensitive, but, you know, they would look at us and say, well, what are the feds doing here? You're law enforcement. Like what, you know, why, why do you need to, we're going to go capture this terrorist. And, right. and so right. I tell them that, look, unless you're going to kill him, you know, if whatever he says to you, you want to be able to use, use against him. And are you CIA officer, Bob, a lot of agency people like to use the name Bob, by the way, whether that's their name or not. <laughs> um, are you going to testify in court? And then that would obviously, you know, they throw their hands up and kind of back up. Oh no, no, I'm not stepping foot in a courtroom. And so we just kind of understood we all had our roles to play. Um, and, and I would say we, we did so quite effectively in many instances, bringing all those different resources and all those different um, abilities to bear to, to try to, you know, disrupt uh, terrorist networks. That sounds about right. I mean, my, my experience was working counterterrorism before and after 9-11. There was a big difference. And before 9-11, it was largely ignorance because most people in the Bureau did not work with CIA officers on a regular basis, unless they were working counterintelligence cases. And most people at CIA did not work with, with FBI agents or other employees, unless they happened to be working a very specific issue. But even in counterterrorism, a lot of the work was done through liaison. It was not done working directly with your counterparts at the other organization. It was funneled through the FBI rep to the counterterrorist center, for example. After 9-11, what a change is mm -hmm. you had networks being built across the organizations. You had a lot more, I don't know what to call it, cross-pollinization. You, you, you had people being embedded, people doing rotational work in the other agency or bureau, leading to more familiarity, more understanding, and uh, hopefully better productive work relationships. But there are different cultures between the organizations that often lead to that kind of scenario you described with Bob <laughs> in terms of, so what are you doing here? Oh, remember what our role is? You know, we actually do get to appear in a court of law. You guys rarely have to. And if you do, it's not good. So that's good to know that in a sense that culture, because the time you're talking about doing this was after 9-11, that the, the time between 9-11 and when you had that experience, at least something was growing, that there were these teams working together such that the cooperation itself didn't seem unusual, even if there was still a little bit of friction just based on the different missions. That's right. And, and I think, you know, one thing I noticed is is it was very generational as well. And, and I'm talking about both both the CIA and, and FBI, where if you had people who were more senior that had been in a long time, they were used to that that culture of, you know, suspicious, being suspicious of the other side. Um, you know, it was the view from the FBI toward the agency was, you know, these are a bunch of, of feet, uh, you know, completely egotistical know-it-alls. Um, and then the view from agency to the FBI, well, these are a bunch of knuckle draggers who just want to break down doors and, you know, I arrest recognize people. both of those descriptions. There right. are actual people like that. There are no, indeed. And there's always a little grain of truth. Um, but, but that was hard to get over. I mean, that, that was, you know, there were growing pains there. Whereas, um, you know, now I think the, as you mentioned, kind of more collaborative, not just liaison to liaison, but you're actually working with um, agency personnel, whether it's in a um, you know national station here domestically or or obviously a station overseas, and so it's it's very interactive, and you're you're understanding their cultures. Um, there there have been instances where you know I, I can think of one in particular um, in um, a uh, specific country where. I was trying to do my work and I, you know, knocked on someone's door and they said, oh, well, FBI was already here, you know, you're back. <laughs> and I thought, all right, so our agency friends are, you know, <laughs> are out there um, maybe pretending to be us to gather information. And so that obviously, you know, went went back to our respective headquarters to kind of iron that out. And what it turned out, it was kind of this, the, and I don't want to say older, I don't say that in a, in a pejorative way, but just a different right. generation of people that, that thought, okay, I'm going to be suspicious of the other side. We're just going to kind of do our own thing. Whereas now it's just, it, it's such hand in glove um, cooperation, you know, in the main, uh, you do have people that, that can go rogue every once in a while, particularly if you have an FBI agent going overseas mm -hmm. who thinks that they can operate without coordinating with the local station, yeah. um, which typically they, they end up finding themselves back home very quickly. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think in the main, it, it's, it's, it, you know, they, both, both agencies have come a long way. Yeah. Talking about this reminds me, 
your book from about three years ago now, Crossfire Hurricane, that was ostensibly about the former president's war, as you put it, on the FBI. But in many ways, it it really was a love letter to the FBI. It was a kind of a thank you for setting me on this career. Here's what I learned. Here's what I think we did right. Here's why I think it's an institution worth bolstering, not worth denigrating. But I remember there was a story in there, and you probably know the details because you wrote it, but there's a story that stuck with me that you told uh, in that book about the man in the Southern Philippines who, who wanted to share information with you. And you asked him something about why, why he wanted to share it with, with you, this FBI guy flying in from Washington, instead of with, with other law enforcement. What, what did he say to you and what did it tell you about the FBI? Yeah, this this was so impactful. So we, I was working counterterrorism uh, overseas. Uh, this is one of the particular instances where we were trying to find um, an HVI, a high value individual, and we were hitting roadblock after roadblock. And so we would actually launch we, the bureau, our team overseas, working with with um, some of your former folks, um, trying to figure out well who who can get us to where we need to go, who can tell us where this uh, terrorism suspect is. And so we actually ended up getting a lead generated from, as you mentioned, there's a, an individual who was in the Southern Philippines who had um, really valuable information. And so, you know, we got word of that. I launched overseas with, with my colleagues. We went through the whole trains, planes, and automobiles to get to the Southern Philippines um, in a very remote area. And as you mentioned, you know, I'm sitting in a vehicle uh, debriefing this person, trying to assess, well, you know, how valuable is the information? And so... As, as he's providing this us this and drawing maps of where the person is and all of this, I, I had that moment that, man, we just went through, you know, thousands and thousands of miles of travel, all these hurdles. And so I asked him, that. I said, well, you know, this is obviously good information, but why didn't you tell it to the local police here? Why didn't you, you know, go into your own local version of the FBI? And he said something that still that sticks with, sticks with, with me to this day and that I wrote about in the book. He says that you're the FBI. Everyone knows you can trust the FBI. And so that was incredibly moving. And, and uh, I, I tell the story in the book, not only for the purposes of explaining that, yes, you know, this obviously is a is a uh, an organization that is highly thought of. I, sh- I, I describe the detriment that could happen if people start to doubt the credibility of, of institutions like the FBI, because, as you know, we know throughout the Trump administration, I mean, he engaged in this um, campaign of attack against the bureau um, there were there were some things that he was right on, you know, as it relates to this action by by certain employees. But this, you know, th- these falsehoods and, and downright lies sometimes. Well, this is an agency that's corrupt, and these people are, you know, violating their oath to come after me, which was complete nonsense. What I point out in the book is that there are real consequences to national security if people start to doubt the FBI, because how many of those potential sources, like the guy we met in the Philippines. If he's on the receiving end of this garbage that, you know, this is a corrupt entity, how many of them are going to give pause and say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have anything to do with that organization. And that trickles down, or I wouldn't say trickle down, that that also applies here uh, domestically as well. When an FBI agent knocks on someone's door and needs information to try to solve a case, to rescue a kidnap victim, to get a threat off the street, the willingness of that person on the other side of the door to cooperate with that agent is directly correlated to their view of the agency. And so the point in telling that story and, and so many others is that if we if we get to a place where the public doubts the FBI is credible, how many cases will be impacted, how many uh, potential source opportunities will be lost. And so it's not just a political campaign that the former president was engaged in. I very much believe and you know, to this day that those who are peddling those lies about the FBI uh, are doing so to, to the potential detriment of U.S. national security. So a lot of that seems like it derives ultimately from the the public image of the FBI. And by public, I mean the whole world image of the FBI, because J. Edgar Hoover, among many other things, did a better job than most government agencies outside of the military in terms of working with Hollywood and giving them stories and having movies made about the brave G-men who go out there and stop organized crime and all kinds of other ne'er-do-wells. And it seems to me that there's almost this institutional legacy lag effect from that, that entire generations grew up thinking the FBI are not only the good guys, but they're effective good guys. And 
that can lead to a bunch of good, like someone even in the Southern Philippines saying, I know that the FBI, is, are, they're the right people to talk to. But it can also reinforce uh, some stereotypes and some myths. And I'm wondering if you can hit some of those that we haven't already hit about local law enforcement and CIA. But what other things does the public perception of the FBI get right, and thankfully so, uh, get wrong, and that's a bad thing? Or maybe in some cases that they get right, and it's it's a hard truth about the FBI, that there's actually something negative about it. But in doing some soul searching and some reporting, you look at it and say, yeah, actually, the Bureau could improve on that front. Well, you know, it's interesting. So so what 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 is right in these depictions? I think, um, you know, I obviously spent a long, long time in the Bureau, so I could say this from experience, that it is unlike any organization, institution that I've been part of. And that is, you know, you have people that go to work every single day with this mission of upholding the Constitution and protecting the American people. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's just different. You know that you are surrounded by people who are mostly there for the same reason. You have outliers, obviously, people who, you know, maybe just want the power, right? You find that in police, some police departments as well. Um, but in the main, it's this, 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 sense of united culture, that we have this mission that we have to do. The hardest thing at the end of the day, and this goes to uh, CIA personnel as well, I, I can remember spending you know time overseas in the wee hours of the, the evening and morning thinking, you know, we can't call it quits because we're not done. Like, when do you, when do you, when do you call it a day? And Absolutely. it's just because people are so motivated by this mission. Um, and so that, that I think they get right when the FBI, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, J. Edgar Hoover was very much a, a brand manager, so to speak. Um, and so much so, obviously, he, he had, you know, so many of his faults, but some of what was propagated at that at the time was some of it was nonsense. I mean, this whole idea of, for example, J. Edgar Hoover going and slapping handcuffs on, you know, bank robbers and things like that. I mean, this was, it was just kind of like a cult of personality, but I think his, uh, for all of his faults, which there are many, and I write about many, many of them in the book. Um, I think what he got right is that, look, you know, we need the public support in order for us to be effective. And so I think that's why he focused so much on public relations. Um, so I, so I think that part is right. I think one, one myth that I always hear, which I always, um, kind of shake my head a, a little is, and this happened a lot during the Mueller investigation, uh, when you have, you would have people on TV talking about, you know, these different agencies, uh, people would say, well, you know, you, these, these are institutions where you check your politics at the door. Like no one talks politics at all. And I would listen to that and say, well, that that's actually nonsense, because if you're around a squad bay of FBI agents and or you have, you know, uh, uh, agency officers and analysts, you know, together, um, you build this friendship. Right. You know how what certain people believe. And so the difference there, I think, is, well, does it impact your work? And I, I never saw anyone who I knew was far right or far left ever, you know, basically act on those views to, to impact a case. But I always find that interesting where people say, well, no, it's, you know, you check it out the door, you never talk politics. I mean, these, these people aren't robots, right? I mean, you think about how uh, the agency, the agency and the FBI recruits people, you want people who are curious about the world, who are hopefully um, intelligent and, you know, are continuing to seek out answers. And you don't find someone like that who also hasn't formed an opinion about the world that they're curious about, right? Um, and so that, that, that I think I've always found interesting, S somewhat lighthearted. I think a big myth of the FBI, um, compared to what you see on TV is never on any of these shows. Do you see an FBI agent doing paperwork? And <laughs> I mentioned that because, you know, it's obviously an entity of the department of justice, you know, right. at, at the, at the, you know, it's baseline, it's building cases for potential prosecution and, but you never see the FBI agent writing up a report. Right. And that is long, tedious, boring at times work. Um, the mantra inside the FBI is five minutes of fun equals five hours of paperwork. So yeah, you can go catch that bad guy. You know, you can bust down his door. You can put him in handcuffs. You're going to spend the rest of your day writing that up. <laughs> um, yeah. And even little things like I was thinking about on the drive to work today. You know, I got in a car accident. It wasn't even my fault. I spent all day doing paperwork because the FBI wants to document every, you know, contact, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I always found that entertaining. And then, you know, when I was, uh, one question I got when I was doing the book tour, someone asked, well, you know, so you say the FBI, you do a lot of writing. Did that help you uh, in your writing career? And I would say absolutely not. In fact, FBI writing 
um, probably hindered my ability to effectively uh, tell a story because it, you know at the bottom at the baseline it's just just the facts. You know, you're writing up your report. This is what happened. This is what this person did. This is what this person said. Very boring. Um, you know, this isn't your time to show off your AP English skills. Um, but anyway, bottom line, a lot of writing that you never see on television because obviously that's kind of boring. It's just like how most movies that are telling otherwise a realistic story aren't spending a lot of time showing people preparing dinner or right. going to the bathroom or <laughs> right. showering unless it's a certain kind of scene, yeah. even though that's the mundane part of life. If it were a true 24 hour snapshot, there'd be a whole lot of watching people sleep, but right. And in FBI, surveillance as well. Right. Yeah. And this goes to both CIA and FBI, these old scenes of surveillance, you're out tracking the guy. Surveillance is the most boring thing in, or one of the most boring actions or uh, endeavors in the entity. Cause most of the time you're just sitting there waiting for something to happen, but obviously it gets dramatized to, you know, to your point. All that makes me wonder. You you talk about the FBI still with with a smile on your face, and you you enjoy you enjoy reliving some of your experiences there, and you have a overall positive impression of the institution and its its people. So why did you leave? It's a good question. I, you know, we talk about brand management and you know the how the public views the FBI. I was actually in a point in a place where. I saw all these attacks on the FBI daily. I mean, just constant attacks from the White House. You know, the FBI, they're crooks, they're corrupt, they're violating their oath. And if you think about it, I mean, if any listener out there, if your boss, the CEO of your company, spent all day saying that you're a crook, <laughs> that would obviously grate on you. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, it's more impactful than that. It's not just, oh, we got our feelings hurt. It's Wow, this is really going to undermine public safety. And at the time, whenever you know there were these cries of uh, the FBI engaged in a witch hunt and you know this whole deep state nonsense, um, I kind of came to that realization that look, you know, no one else is speaking up on our behalf uh, to to defend the FBI to say here's what's real, here's what's not. And by the way, the FBI is not a perfect entity. I mean, they were again they're, they're human beings, so they they screw up a lot. Um, but but this whole campaign of well, let's just convince the American public that these people are corrupt so that whenever Mueller is finished with his work, everything's in doubt. Um, I just kind of came to that point that, look, I've been in for almost 13 years. Um, I got a long way to go. I don't want to look back on retirement and think, well, you could have spoken out and, you know, defended the, uh, you know, your, your colleagues against the false al allegations, but just decided to put your head down, you know, keep your head down and draw a paycheck. And so, that was that weird reality that I have to step out of this entity yeah. in order to uh, effectively serve this entity. Because had I stayed in and you know just you know leaked to reporters about what was going on or our thoughts, I mean that would actually fulfill that whole deep state nonsense myth, right? You have these entities that are just you know criticizing the the, uh, yeah. the president from within, and so that was a, that. That's a long winded kind of answer to your question, but I will say that it you know. Now I cover not just the federal law enforcement, but also local law enforcement around the country of, you know, which uh, I firmly believe that most cops out there are good. Um, there are bad cops out there, like there are, you know, FBI agents that, that uh, screw up. And I think it's being able to not just tell the good stories, but also to hold their feet to the fire. Because mm -hmm. I'll tell you that there is no, there's no quicker way to infuriate a good FBI agent or a good cop than to describe the actions of a bad cop, um, yeah. because not only does it go against their own, you know, the oath that they swore, but it also impacts the public's view of these institutions. So I mentioned that to say, like, my job now covering law enforcement is not a mouthpiece for law enforcement. Um, you know, we'll cover, we'll cover positive stories when they happen, but also whether it's, you know, the case in Minneapolis with George Floyd, um, you know, a, a number of, of different cases since then that I've covered where the police have engaged in excessive use of force, it's pointing that out um, so that the public understands that there has to be accountability. And the last thing I'll say on that topic, it reminds me when I was in uh, at the FBI Academy, we uh, there was one class in particular, it was a legal class. And I remember the instructor coming in and holding up a copy of the Washington Post. And this was during, you remember the whole NS, NSL debacle, right? National security letters where the FBI was issu issuing them like, you know, candy. Um, the instructor said that you... Everything you do, whether it's a FISA warrant, whether it's a national security letter, anytime you're you're pursuing something in an invasive way, you better justify that as though your case is going to show up on the front page of the Washington Post, and you better to a you know to a letter have everything solid, no cutting corners. Um, and that stuck with me then, and that sticks with me now. That yeah, now I'm on that end of it. That when there are mistakes, 
I'm the Washington Post side, the CNN side, that's going to say we are going to slam anyone who abuses their power in a way that, that exposes it and ensures that they're held accountable, because I think that's the role in journalism, right? You take the good with the bad, uh, but these are entities with incredible power. So I, I, I think, in a way, what we're doing now is a public service. What do you miss by leaving? And I mean specifically by that, because I've, I've had the, the thought too, which is generally I left and I'm comfortable with that choice for the right reasons, but there are a few jobs, there are a few missions that I do look back and say, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't miss everything that I got away from, but it would have been really nice to work on X. Uh, what is that X for you? What is it within the Bureau's large mission set, either geographically or functionally? What is something that you say, you know, in an alternate universe, if I stayed in the Bureau, I really would have enjoyed doing this? It's it's very much, uh, the answer to that question very much falls within the the uh, space of the FBI's counterterrorism mission, which I spent, you know, the majority of my time working. And I still, I mean, there are there are bad guys out there that we never got that, you know, and I say bad guys, I use that obviously um, colloquially. I mean, terror, terrorists, terrorists who have done really bad things and have killed people um, that still have not been brought to justice. And you know, I can I can think of one incident in particular. One case I worked, there was a a group that had killed um, uh, U.S. military personnel overseas, and so I, I launched over in that that to conduct that investigation. We were building sources. We were helping prosecute the people that we did catch uh, overseas because we found that the threshold for um, uh, entering evidence, for example, in that host nation's judicial system was a lot less cumbersome than having to bring witnesses back to the U.S. and, you know, try to prosecute on the U.S. side. So we did a lot of work overseas, but there are still people, part of that case, for example, that we know are still out there. Um, and so that never goes away. That, that you know, it, 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 I'm just as infuriated now thinking about some of the actions of some of these people as I was when I was, you know, both in the Bureau. But that said, it's, it's very much an entity that is filled with talented people, the FBI. And so I know that even stepping out, there are still people that have, are, are just as passionate or more passionate than I was that are focusing on, on that every single day. And that's the beauty. You know, there are no indispensable people in the FBI, probably same with CIA and other, other entities. Um, you know, the FBI was around a lot longer than I've been alive, and it'll be a lot, around a lot longer after I'm long gone. Um, and you have people that are continuing you know, to, to do that mission. Um, I'll also say that I, I, find a, I find a lot of overlap in, in these two fields. And I, I don't think I would have left the Bureau just you know, for any particular reason, certainly not you know, for um, uh, financial reasons, people throwing money at you. But, um, but, but I needed to ensure that there was also a mission associated with, with what I did next. And in journalism, mm -hmm. it is, it's very much a mission-driven entity. And it's very similar to an FBI agent. Something happens. You try to investigate what happened, you talk to people, you build sources, and you try to tell the story. Um, I wish I still had subpoena power, <laughs> which I don't. That would actually help me do my job a lot better. Um, but there are a lot of similarities there and, and a lot of uh, uh, similar situations where you find yourself rewarded by what you're doing. Well, you raise a good point. You, you could have gone into consulting or casino security, as right. several senior FBI uh, leaders have done in the past, but you wanted to go into journalism and, and not as an analyst, you know, which I and many of my former colleagues and your former colleagues have done to shed light on issues based on your experiences and put reporting in context. You, you went the reporter route. You, you actually have a career as a reporter. You mentioned the sense of mission that, that it, it has some of the similar itches being scratched for you. But what is it about journalism that attracts you in terms of what's new and different to give you new challenges? You know, the, the, the roles are very similar. I mean, when, when, when I was an FBI agent, obviously, if there's someone who had committed a federal crime, we, we start an investigation. We try to figure out what happened. And you're motivated by bringing justice to people who may have been wronged. Um, obviously, you, you know, you have to draw the line. You can't be too zealous, right, in, in, in your work. It's very much, okay, here you know, here, here, here's the law. How do we apply the law to what happened here and then go hold people accountable? Uh, it's that same sense of mission in journalism as well. I mean, I'm motivated by people, for example, covering crime, issues of crime and, and law enforcement. Um, I am motivated by people who take advantage of other people or harm other people, who prey on other people. 
Um, and that's obviously, you know, my beat is very specialized and you know, think of everything that goes on the news in a given day, you know, I cover those kind of criminal, criminal issues. Um, and, and it's, it's rewarding in that sense that look, someone out there thinks that it is okay to harm someone else. Um, and so through our reporting, we're going to expose that, whether it's a violent criminal or, you know, I would say, you know, just as important, um, public corruption, for example, I get so motiv motivated covering these public corruption cases, because if you think about it at, you know, at the end of the day, it's someone who was asked the public for, um, the power to be in public office and then uses that position to enrich themselves, um, which that is so infuriating to me. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's motivating and it's, and it's rewarding in a sense. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, when I started at CNN, I, I was briefly an, uh, an analyst, a full-time analyst, but then quickly went into the reporting because I was, I was basically still, um, uh, you know, operating on my FBI agent skills. Well, you know, I, I don't want to just talk about this thing that happened, but actually know someone who might answer a question, you know, for us uh, in some pol some police department or some you know FBI office. Um, and so quickly, kind of got into the news gathering side, and and it's very rewarding. It's it's very difficult. Um, a lot, you know, it's easier for people to talk to you when you're an FBI agent. And you have a badge um, in journalism, not so much. But I mm -hmm. think it, it is very rewarding, and and I I feel rewarded every single day as I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm listening to the LAPD's uh, scanner here in Los Angeles, there's a manhunt going on right now. Oh. Someone who uh, uh, went on a crime spree, shot five people. Um, and so the police are trying to catch him. And so we, I've been, you know, just before we came on here, I was working on that story uh, because we want to be able to alert the public that this is going on, hopefully get this person captured. And that's a sense of, of uh, reward for us if we're able to help, you know, do that. Let's turn to the mass shootings, because that's not all you cover, but it seems to be a whole lot of what's taken your time, unfortunately, for reasons beyond your control. Let's do a, a case study. Let's use Highland Park, Illinois. Break down what happens from your perspective when one of these tragedies occurs. I mean, did you see the breaking news and call in? Did a producer call you to alert you before you saw it? Did you book a flight to Chicago uh, ASAP before even asking questions because you knew you were going to be on the ground? How does it how does it develop when a tragedy occurs that you find yourself on the scene and reporting on it even as you're trying to acquire the basic information? Well, there are no two days that are alike uh, in the life of a, of a reporter, and it's a very exhausting job. It's a very exhausting beat. Um, and just to give you an example, I was actually in Washington um, covering, uh, the Supreme court. There were obviously a lot of decisions coming out of there. Um, and that's, and I apologize to you for us not being able to link up when I was there, but, but then all this breaking news started happening. Um, so I actually went from, uh, Washington. I drove to Akron, Ohio, because it was a police involved shooting where there was a suspect who, uh, police were chasing. Um, they alleged that he, he, uh, fired out, out, out of his vehicle during this chase. And upon stopping him, eight police officers opened fire and they later determined that he didn't have a gun on him at the time. And so obviously very contentious. This was a, um, uh, a, a man of color who uh, I don't know if he was known to, to police before then in that location, but it just shows kind of this pattern. Well, are police acting the way they should be? Are they treating everyone fairly? Um, and so that that investigation is very much underway right now. But I was I got on the ground in Akron to cover that story. And then to your question, I get word uh, from CNN Atlanta, which is our national desk. They're, that's our headquarters. They keep tabs on things that are happening all over the world. And they send me a note saying, hey, there's this thing developing in the Chicago area. It looks like a shooting. And David, I mean, quite honestly, maybe this is an indictment of our time. Th that doesn't that doesn't cause me to act when someone says there's been a shooting somewhere because right. there's there's so many shootings. And so right. it's just a matter of trying to figure out, well, what is it that we're dealing with? Um, and so my, uh, my boss actually called me and said, Hey, we're redirecting you yet again. You know, we knew you went from Washington to Akron. Now we need you to get to Chicago ASAP because this looks really, really bad. So just in that um, time frame, in a matter of minutes, it went from there's a shooting, but a shrug, not knowing if it's just one of daily shootings. It went from that to Josh, you are going there and get there as soon as you can, because this is something different. 
That's right, and particularly with the the um, the reality that there was a manhunt underway, that the suspect had not been caught. I mean, so many of these incidents, you either see the shooter kill themselves, they're engaged by law enforcement uh, and are killed, or they're arrested. But there was this period where the suspect got away, um, and you know. Just to give you an example, yeah. I mean, just to show you how strange this this field is sometimes. So I drove from Akron to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a long not an drive, ideal, but it's doable. It's, yeah, it's a long drive. I mean, you know, obviously we're also dealing with flights, um, you know, on the 4th of July. And so that was very tough to actually find, find flights. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to hightail it there. Um, so as I get into the Chicago area, police started pushing out um, a description of the suspect in the suspect's vehicle. And of course, the first thing I'm thinking is, wow, what what would it be like if I saw this suspect right now, right? I'm on the freeway, wow. who knows, right? At one in, one in a million chance. Or if you were driving the same vehicle and yeah, that would pulled over. That would, yeah, exactly. Well, and, and I saw other vehicles that were similar. And I, yeah. that's the first thing I thought, well, wow, that, you know, these people, I hope they understand what's going on. Um, and so, and while I'm driving, I'm reporting, I'm calling sources, I'm trying to gather information and, and feeding that back to the network so we understand kind of wh- where we are. Um, but what was so interesting, so I get into the Chicago and I start heading to the scene of the mass shooting where then I was g- going to uh, go live from. And I pull up there, I'm, I'm at the scene for a bit. And my focus is, since I cover law enforcement, is focusing on their posture, right? What what are they doing? And to just get a sense of, of kind of what's happening in their world, uh, particularly with this manhunt going on. And so I look out of the corner of my eye and I see this cop like grabbing his ear, like he's listening to his earpiece. And then there's activity and the cops start rushing to their vehicle. I'm thinking, okay, something's happening here. And I have to be on TV in 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I see the tactical SWAT team just barrel out of this area. And, you know, that's a clue, right? <laughs> so I, uh, I'm on the phone with my boss and he's trying to tell me, okay, here's where the, the live shot is going to be. And I said, you know, actually, I'm going to follow this SWAT vehicle because something is happening. Um, and he said, well, you know, you have to be on TV. I said, I know, I know. I said, but this, this is important. He said, okay, I'll let, I'll let the network know that we've got some, something emergent is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, as a reporter, we have to kind of follow at a distance, right? There, you have to be safe. You can't, you know, be right up on the cops. Um, and so anyway, so we, we drive for uh, about four miles and I'm staying way behind the, the police and we roll up on the suspect's car. Uh, so what had happened is the uh, it was a, con- a concerned citizen, an alert citizen, saw the description, called the police. A police officer saw the car, executed a traffic stop, and then they called in the cavalry. Um, and so I'm there as the first reporter on the scene, yeah. and I have no camera person with me. And so I actually pulled up my cell phone. Um, we have a, an app where you can plug that right directly to Atlanta, and they get your feed. And so I was actually on the phone reporting live from the scene of that arrest, uh, using one phone, one camera phone, you know, to, to show the image, another phone talking to Wolf Blitzer. Um, and then, and then they got him. And then the next question was, okay, our reporting now we're going to focus on, well, what was the motive and to, to kind of try to try to get all, all of that squared yeah. away. Um, but anyway, to answer your question, you never know what any day is going to bring. And then certainly even within a story, you don't know what's actually going to happen. And there's so many threads, um, with this particular story, you know, warning signs and all that. So our work certainly isn't done. You mentioned that there was a, a manhunt in this case, which is not often true. It is sometimes true, but not not often true in these in these types of mass shootings. The reporting changes a bit when there's a manhunt because if you ask the average American the names of the shooters, and and you can bring out a list, you can bring out Buffalo, you can bring out you know you can just go down your list of the last year, and people might remember that an incident occurred in each of these locations. But I'm betting that 99 out of 100 Americans, even those familiar with the incidents you're talking about, can't name the shooter because most reputable news organizations have decided that they are not going to constantly put up the picture of the shooter. They're not going to mention the name over and over again to contribute to the dynamic of notoriety and attention-seeking behavior that can drive some of these. But it's different when there's a manhunt. Um, what's what's different, and and how does that affect your reporting on the scene? Hundred percent. I mean, th- and that's something that I'm always balancing. I I do not like saying the name of the shooter. I don't like showing the shooter. I think in this case, uh, I can remember one time that I actually said the suspect's name, which I'm not going to say here uh, on the air. Uh, and that was the moment he was actually formally charged. And that's kind of a journalistic thing, right? Okay, the, the state alleges that this person did X. 
But after that, I have no interest in giving this person any notoriety because we know so many of these shooters actually look for that. Uh, they, they, they want to be heroes. They want to be infamous, so to speak. Um, but as you mentioned, during a manhunt, it is, and this gets to the public, access, uh, public service aspect of journalism, I think, that we are, in a sense, helping ensure public safety by getting that information out there. You know, if, if the police stand at a, at a lectern and, you know, hold a press conference and announce something uh, about a suspect or that there's a threat out there, if we're not using our airwaves to get that information out, then, you know, it's kind of the, the tree falling in the forest with no one around, right? And so um, it turns out in this instance, it was that publicity, and I don't say this to, to pat ourselves on the back, it's just our job. It was us pushing that information out to the public that, that informed a citizen about the description of the car, and that citizen then saw the vehicle and called police. Um, I think in that in that instance, it's fair game to name the suspect, to show the suspect's face, because you were trying to alert a anyone who sees this, the person that hey, call nine one one. This person's armed and dangerous. But also, police were still in the information gathering phase. They wanted anyone who knew this suspect to reach out to them and to notify them and to provide as much information. Uh, but to your point, once the manhunt is over, I think that's that's the point where we stop uh, giving any notoriety to to the shooter. And lastly, you know, I'll say I've, I've thought about this a lot. I've covered a lot of mass shootings. Quite frankly, David, I don't remember a lot of the names of, of yeah. the shooters. And I think that's because there's not any there's no muscle memory. I haven't been I don't say the names. And so I, you know, I just as soon right. forget about them. Right. I also wonder how helpful it is. And I I guess I can play both sides of this one, Josh. On the one hand, if it's a manhunt and they're trying to find this individual, of course, a description of the car, got it. Um, maybe a physical description of the, the suspect, got it. The name, I can argue both sides of. Um, you're putting it out there. You are giving notoriety. You're giving them publicity. On the other hand, that may be the trigger that helps someone identify it is you know what? I, I wasn't really paying attention, but I heard that name as I was walking by the television. And that's the guy that always hangs out. I, I see him in the park all the time. And we chatted that one time. And maybe that's the place he goes after an incident like this. So I, I can make a case on both sides for when there's an active manhunt of pushing that name out as much as possible to try to keep others out of danger and apprehend the, the suspect quickly even as I find myself saying, no, 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 that person's name is now, if not a role model for somebody else, um, he, he got some of what perhaps he wanted by having his name broadcast out to tens of millions of people. Yeah, no, and I, and I certainly fall down on, uh, on that side of the argument the, that, you know, get the name out there if, if it's in a manhunt, if you're in a manhunt situation. This shooter, for example, his name is very unique. Um, I've never heard his last name before. And so that in and of itself, if it's not something like, you know, John Smith, I mean, if it's if it's recognizable, that's that's obviously helpful. Um, but you just don't know if, as you mentioned, someone hearing it and, and thinking, oh, yeah, I know that person or whether it's the gas station clerk who saw his, you know, his ID, whether it's the ticket agent at the airport as he's trying to flee, you know, to get out of town. Um, all that's important. All that's an important uh, piece of information of you know, the name to maybe trigger some response, some memory, um, uh, so that someone picks up the phone and calls, you know, calls the police. So then, after after the shooting has happened, um, and, and not this is a rare case for you, right, where you're actually seeing the apprehension of the suspect uh, after the search. After that, you are still on the ground for, in some cases many hours, but usually several days after one of these incidents. What are you doing at that point? Because you do not have, I know you have a very good virtual Rolodex of contacts and people you can talk to to get insight on investigations, prosecutions, all the, all the stuff involving this, but not for every local jurisdiction across the country. The Highland Park Police Department was probably not top on your list of contacts. And yet you're spending the next couple of days trying to provide information and insight to people, usually relying on those people, not relying on the people where you've reported before. How do you how do you do that when they themselves are extremely busy at the time handling the aftermath of an incident? Well, I guess I would say first that that law enforcement is um, probably a lot smaller a world than you think as far as who knows whom and uh, kind of, you know, people interacting, whether it's at conferences or, um, 
So, so it's a small world. And so that's the first thing I try to determine is, well, what's the closest source of authoritative information that we might be able to get? Um, and that's somewhat journalism 101, right? You're talking to people, trying to gather information. Maybe they're not inclined at the outset to provide information. And so it's just building those relationships, sometimes you know, very quickly. Um, but having contacts across the country and law enforcement at all levels, I've, I've found has been very, very beneficial. Um, because then people can vouch for you as well, right? So if I know someone who might know someone in the department right. where I want to gather right. some information, it's, you know, okay, this guy's a, a straight shooter. He's, you know, you may not like what he's going to say. I mean, you take the case of Uvalde, for example, right? With that, that incident where, you know, we've been holding those uh, law enforcement agencies, their feet to the fire. You might not like what we're going to say, but I think it's, I'm, I'm fair in what I, in what I do. Um, so it's just trying to gather information in, in Highland Park. To their credit, the police were providing information freely, publicly, on a routine rolling basis. You know, that's a good point, is there's a there's a natural variance here among various departments, which ones actually have media people that are funneling that information as opposed to just saying, wait for the next press conference that we'll hold in six hours. Some of them have people made available to answer background questions. Some of them have all hands on deck for a pursuit. So I guess there's going to be some differences inherent. Yeah, no, most definitely. And then there are also multiple agencies involved, right? So you have the FBI that's there that's doing the forensic examination of, of the crime scene. You have obviously the local law enforcement that's running the lead. You have the ATF that's trying to trace the weapon. So as a reporter, those are all agencies that I'm trying to, um, you know, to ping and to gra- gather information from in order to try to help tell the story. Okay, what, what you know, what is it that happened here? Um, and so, to your question about, well, what, well, what are you doing? So it's, I'm, I'm trying to gather information uh, as I'm there. And by the way, I should say, I'm not the only reporter that's there. I mean, we had a large team of people that were doing a lot of really good work. Um, others, for example, were focusing on the victims, right? And telling their story, um, which is obviously very important. Whereas my, my focus is more on the investigation, um, but gathering information. And then at some point, you know, as these, these things take their, their natural course, the suspect is then going to be charged and then now it's within the purview of prosecutors, so it's trying to gather information from them. You know, what are you finding? What What are your plans? What do you see coming down the road as far as um, where this case goes from here? So, uh, uh, never a lack of of things to do. Um, you know, there's always a, a lot going on. And then the last piece is the shooter's family, right? Trying to gather. Well, can we get an interview with the father, with the mother, who they both come came under uh, extreme scrutiny in this case, and I think rightly so. Um, based on their lack of picking up the phone <laughs> and, you know, reporting certain things. Um, and so it's just, there, there, there's so much to cover as a journalist and you're trying to gather what you think is important and try to rack and stack, as they say, you know, prior, prioritize your time um, in order to effectively tell the story. I assume there's also a big difference between, I don't know how to put this, um, between the aftermath of an incident where, your sense and your experience tells you that the the local police department, uh, perhaps state entities, certainly federal entities are involved, and they're all doing things the way that these things are normally done. That is, you're reporting on it, you're giving details, but it's the pace and the the information flow and the results of the investigation at a certain point in time seem to make sense to you such that when there's an outlier, and even from an outside perspective, I get the sense that Uvalde, Texas is a real outlier in terms of what happened that day, and in terms of what's happening, in terms of the releasing of footage, in terms of the transparency to the public. That one seems different enough that as a reporter, it's almost like you're using a different part of your brain then. You're not just following the TikTok of an investigation and describing how it goes along and checking boxes because you've been there. But in this case, it's it's almost like solving a mystery as to what's actually going on. No, it is. It, you know, and it's interesting if you compare these two cases. So Uvalde with what happened in Highland Park, um, you know, as reporters, we're, we are naturally suspicious, right, of anything that someone tells you. Um, you want to be able to verify, corroborate, confirm, um, to determine whether or not what you're being told is is accurate, and what we found in the case of Uvalde, which is so so, I mean, bizarre is the is the only way I think to describe it right now. Obviously, for 
family members of the victims, it, 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 it's, hard, it's hurtful, right? The way that the police have handled this, the state police, local police, local officials, and that is basically shutting out the families and not providing any information. And when they do provide information, it conflicts and there's all this backbiting. They're, you know, agencies are blaming other agencies, but refusing to, to ask, to answer hard questions of their own. Um, you know, you have the state police there in Texas, the colonel who's basically pointing fingers at local law enforcement. And then when local law enforcement says, well, your, your officers were there in the school too, and they didn't do anything, the state police clam up and they, you know, they don't want to say anything. And so I say bizarre because I've never seen anything like that, the way that that whole thing has been handled. Um, and, you know, there's this mantra in public relations that, you know, bad news doesn't get better with age, right? You get it out, you get it out fast. Uh, but it looks like there, it, it you know, it's been described as a cover up by many victims' families who think that they are not being told the true story because yeah. it may be embarrassing for some of these law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. Compare that with what happened in Highland Park, where police came out very quickly yeah. and they provided information. But then they did something that was really interesting. Is and I was I was standing at this press conference. Is they said we want to um, we want to explain for you prior police encounters that the suspect had. Mm -hmm. And they proceeded to lay out that law enforcement was called to the suspect's home because he was threatening suicide. Yep. They were called to his home because he was threatening to kill members of his family. And I got the first question out of that press conference and, and one of the, the deputy chief, who I think you know did a really good job throughout the, the investigation, I asked him, I said, well, was that a missed opportunity for oh, yeah. law enforcement to try to stop this guy? He knew the question was coming, mm -hmm. but you know, if this was the Texas model, they may not have even brought that up at all right. to say, look, hey, there's this past instance that's kind of questionable that we know maybe puts us in a bad light. But when you're covering someone who willfully brings up information that may be negative towards that particular agency, you you respect that in a sense that look they know that okay they're gonna they're gonna come forward and be more transparent and so it's just um, I, I try to approach each agency with a heavy dose of of suspicion just that's our job obviously um, but it, it's easier than you think to, to detect, detect when someone is is you know trying to steer you wrong or just to, to flat out lie even in your reporting role there's really two different jobs in a case like this. One of them is to describe what's going on, almost to serve like the analyst on the scene. You know, this, this is what we can expect at this point in the investigation. This is what we shouldn't expect for hours or days. This is what they're telling us. This is what sources are telling us, but they're not willing to go public. That, that's part of the job is to describe. But in a case like the one you're talking about in Texas, you, you almost become the investigative reporter. And that's a very different skill set than, than reporting, perhaps synthesizing, maybe some assessing. The investigative reporter, you know, you, you've got to virtually bust down doors. You've got to be more aggressive in some ways personally. You've certainly got to be more skeptical. It's not as much about building relationships uh, for future cases as it is trying to get the truth out right now from people who seem to be hiding something. Which one do you prefer more? You said you wanted to be a reporter. Which side of that appeals to you more? And do you feel like you can adequately do both? I think the the first part, explaining what happened, I mean, that's that's somewhat easier, obviously. I mean, you, ha you have information and you can see for yourself or you're, you know, you're talking to, to witnesses. This is what happened here. I, I personally, I, I tend to like the other side, which is a lot more difficult. And that is trying to find out something that someone doesn't want to tell me, someone in power. Um, and this is where the skill sets, whether it's an FBI agent or a CIA officer, are very similar to that of a reporter. If you're out there, I mean, and you know this as well, but for the good of our listeners, when either uh, a CIA officer or an FBI agent is trying to recruit a source, you always ask yourself, well, what is the intelligence gap here that we're trying to fill? What is it that we need to know? And then you go about trying to find people who have access to that information and trying to figure out, well, what is it that would motivate them to tell me something? Um, unlike those fields and law enforcement, we don't pay our sources. <laughs> that often is a motivator in you know the, the national security world. Um, but it's very similar as a reporter trying to figure out, okay, who who knows what I need to know and what's a possible motivation. And an example like um, you just gave, you know, there's this publication, the Texas Tribune, there there in Texas, which has been doing dogged reporting. They've been at the forefront of scoop after scoop. 
um, really, really impressive journalism. And obviously, I don't know who their sources are, but if I had to guess, I would imagine that th that there are people out there that are motivated by the lies that are being told and wanting to help divulge what actually is the truth. Um, and so that that's that's a heck of a motivator. But that's obviously a lot more a lot harder to find sources of information that are willing a willing to tell you something. Um, but B, trying to find out, well, what, what is the motivation? I will say, uh, and this is where I give um, uh, complete props and respect to my colleagues who cover politics, which obviously I don't cover you know, political campaigns and the like. You can imagine that people are motivated in many different ways why they might want to provide a reporter with information. And so their job is actually a lot harder to try to figure out, well, am I being completely BS here or... Um, you know, what, what, what is this person trying to achieve by giving me the report of this information? We have to do that, um, uh, obviously, ourselves covering law enforcement, but, but it is hard. It's hard work to try to find people who know yeah. what you want to know. Um, but also, it's, it's a lot more, that much more rewarding when you can get that little nugget of information uh, that helps inform the public. That is rewarding. There's another challenging part to it as well that you don't talk about much. And frankly, most reporters don't talk about much because it's part of the job and you don't want to in any way diminish the reporting mission and the objectivity. But that is, in your case in particular, you're dealing often with no kidding tragedy. You're dealing with death, sometimes mass death, your job involves, yes, talking to law enforcement and talking to investigators, but sometimes interacting with the, the families or the people around the victims who have just experienced gut-wrenching, horrific loss. And in addition to being a reporter, Josh, you're, you're a caring human being. How do, you, how do you manage that? How do you manage the emotional side of the job, which is being calm, cool, collected, and objective, even as something inside your heart and soul is screaming at the agony that you're seeing around you? You know, I don't, I don't know, um, process-wise, I don't, I don't know how, how this manifested over the years, but I do know that past experience being in the FBI, covering bombings overseas and shootings overseas, you know, involving American citizens and American interests. Um, I think that set the stage for being able to cover these things. Now, um, I can still remember, uh, you know, my first cases as a baby agent, you know, overseas, sitting across from a victim who lost a loved one um, and, and just being overwhelmed. But in talking to obviously more senior agents who, you know, they, they, they uh, try to school you on, on, you know, the rules of the road. Um, you just learn to kind of set that aside and compartmentalize, I think, because at some point you realize, well, if we're all, you know, emotional wrecks, then, then that's not going to help anyone. Right. I'm not gonna be able to do my job as an investigator if I'm so overwhelmed. Um, and that's why, you know, and this, I don't want to get too graphic, but the whole notion of, um, how do I say this delicately? The the graphic aftermath of some incidents, yeah. what happens to certain victims, yeah. not being phased by seeing that kind of stuff because I was conditioned in a former life um, to to you know to do just that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so that, that that's how I approach the role as a reporter now is obviously a very tough topic, very tragic topics that I cover, but kind of compartmentalizing that, setting that aside, and just getting to here's the story that needs to be told. Um, and not to put myself on the couch here, but I will tell you that with every incident, there comes a time where it just hits me. Yeah. Um, and sadly, more time seems to be going by after each tragedy before that moment comes. And maybe that's, you know, kind of an indictment of just this culture of, of just tragedy after tragedy that the nation is experiencing. But I will say that what I, what I try to do and, and somewhat, you know, maybe I don't try to do, it just happens naturally, is just to focus on the mission, just and, but know that whether it's a, one day, two days, a week, there's going to come that moment where it just comes surging. Um, and, and I just have to take a moment and, you know, just kind of process that. One other aspect of this, um, we're, we're certainly not the same age, but I think the dynamic I had when I was growing up probably was still true when you were growing up, which is that you watched the news and it was reporting 
and it was hopefully objective, but there was very little editorializing except for perhaps at the end of a newscast, you might have the anchor take a personal privilege and do a short little personal vignette. But almost always it was not. Almost always it was reading the headlines, kicking it to the reporter, getting it back from the reporter saying, thank you, Josh. Uh, That is very different now in a whole lot of different venues, Uh, whether it's the cable news or the local news, you see a lot more of the anchors saying what's going on, giving almost a personal take on it. Like, this is unacceptable that this is happening in our country at this rate. Let's go to Josh. Hmm. And then you report. And then it comes back to them and they're shaking their head in disgust, which I think is a natural human reaction to a mass shooting. So I'm not judging anyone's personal reactions. But but then editorializing in their conversation about it. And it happens uh, not just on the so-called opinion host shows, but it's happening in the so-called news hours where hosts are pronouncing their judgment on what you're reporting in real time. Does that put a different burden on you as a reporter? And what do you think that is doing to the viewing public who is now watching not just for the facts, but watching because they they like the personal take of this anchor when when they almost routinely editorialize on something they're reporting on. It's a great question, and I don't I don't I don't want I don't want this to come across as a punt, you know, punting on the question. But I think my beat is somewhat unique. Um, you know, when you're covering violence, there aren't or too many people mass celebrating tragedy. mass shootings. We'll put it that way. Yeah. No. Exactly. I mean, there's you know when I'm covering a mass shooting, I don't pause to think, well, you know, let's get the shooter side of this and, you know, kind of figure out, well, what, what's, right, you know, right. what, are, what were they thinking? We do so from a motive to find out the motivation, but I'm not doing it out of some journalistic, well, we really need to, you know, get their side of this. Um, and so I think that affords me to be a little, I mean, I, I don't get opinionated, you know, in, in my reporting, it's okay. Here's, here, here are the facts. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's maybe easier to say what you're feeling. I mean, for example, you know, as I was covering the the shooting, for example, in Highland Park, I think I, I said on the air at one point that, and this was after a um, eight-year-old boy was, uh, he was shot and the doctors determined that he was going to be paralyzed from their waist down. That was a new, a new piece of information that came up as we were in the middle of our reporting. Um, I think I said that, you know, this, this shooting is nothing short of disgusting. I mean, this is infuriating and this is disgusting. Um, that's opinionated, but I think in my beat, I don't think you would find many sane, normal people who would disagree with that. Right. I do agree with you mm-hmm. on other topics, politics and all of that. I mean, I, I don't really have a stomach for, um, uh, opinion journalism. Um, but I would just say on my beat, it, it kind of falls in, I guess, a unique category. Would you like to lose your job? because we find a way of addressing mass shootings in this country and you're suddenly having to report on, you know, boring criminal proceedings in courts of law instead of flying to a mass shooting scene after mass shooting scene. I've said this before. I, I wish I were unemployed, um, covering this beat. I mean, it, you know, that, that would mean that, that things are right in the world. Um, it's, you know, there would, there would always be something to do in the field of news, but, particularly as it relates to this beat covering violence, I, I wish it didn't, didn't exist. I wish that we yeah. didn't have to go through this, um, you know, same process over and over. And it, and it becomes so routine, sadly, the way we as a nation approach these. Something happens, we're shocked, we're trying to figure out what the motivation is, but it seems as soon as we find the motivation, then people just kind of move on. Ah, yep. okay, so that's what happened. That's why this person did that. Yep. Uh, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I, 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 I wish that this beat didn't even exist. Right. Well, we've reached the point in our podcast, Josh, where I reach into our chatterbox and we reach in and grab a random question. Let's see what it has to offer you. Tell us your favorite or least favorite spy or political thriller movie or TV show. So I will say without question, um, I'll I'll have to broaden it because it's the author in general and that's uh, Daniel Silva who mm. writes the Gabriel on series yep. um, about a, an Israeli spy um, who works with a multitude of agencies, the CIA and other entities, sometimes with, you know, the, the Catholic church um, an incredible, an incredible series. So I would highly recommend that. I have to say full disclosure, um, 
Danny Silva is uh, married to my colleague, Jamie Gangel at mm-hmm. CNN, who they're both, both dear friends. But I can also tell you, I was a fan of his writing long before we ever met. Um, and in fact, I kind of, uh, uh, I kind of did the fanboy thing once, you know, when we first met, like, oh my God, like I get to work with, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, your, your, uh, your wife, you know, and, and obviously we're now friends. Um, so the Daniel, Daniel Silva series, Gabriel Lon is my favorite thriller. And I also just found out, and maybe this is a teaser and, and I by the way, I get nothing for promoting this book. Um, <laughs> but I just found out that the next, uh, book comes out this month yep. and apparently I am featured in it. <laughs> I learned. So I haven't read it. I haven't got an advanced copy. Um, but my colleague, actually, John Berman, uh, yeah. on our morning show, sent me a note and said, oh, my God, you're in this book. So I can't wait to see what, what that's all about. But a great series. In, in one of Danny Silva's books, you being featured in it could go either direction, right? Yeah. There's some really bad characters in those books and some really good people. And I don't know where you're going to come out on this. You and I are on the same wavelength. I actually, my colleague, Jamie, I actually asked her, um, can you confirm? Am I in the book? She said, yeah. And I said, well, wait a minute. Before I celebrate, do I get killed off or you know, right. how does this turn out? So yeah. she said, I'll have to read the book. Well, we appreciate the full disclosure and we'll, I'll give you a full disclosure of our own, which is after this episode of Chatter, the next episode of Chatter features Danny Silva talking about <laughs> his books with uh, co-host Shane Harris. Um, Amazing. So yes, his book will be published not long after People are listening to this episode originally, and you'll be hearing Shane talking to Danny all about it right after uh, Danny's book drops. And we'll see what happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a resolution by then. <laughs> there you go. Josh, thank you for sharing your experiences, your, your insights, uh, and your thoughts on things. I really appreciate you spending the time with us. My pleasure. Thanks, David. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.